And uh, so we are on uh, lesson four of the third quarter called The Bread of Life, John 6, 1 through 8, 11. And we pray that you'll give us understanding. Okay. So John 6. John 5 was about two resurrections. Jesus talked about two resurrections. He talks about the witness of John the Baptist. Remember, this is a, to present evidence to the unsaved of who Jesus is and why they should trust him for eternal life. So it reads like a legal brief, really. It has a lot of testimony. And he talks about the testimony of his miraculous works, the testimony of the Father, and the testimony of the Scripture about who he is. And so now, in this lesson, we're, we are going to witness the fourth and the fifth signs that John gives, and one of the first I am statements in the book. So can I get somebody to read uh, chapter 6, 1 through 13? What are you seeing in this passage? Yeah, Jesus is testing. So he asked them to do something impossible. <laughs> right? Right. There was, there was a need, and it was a need that they could not take care of on their own. And he asked them how to, how to do it. You know, does the Lord do things like that to us? Almost every day. It seems like, doesn't he? <laughs> We're saved by faith. But we also need to live by faith. And faith needs exercise to strengthen. Faith is not constant. Does, does everyone agree with this? That faith is not, sometimes your faith is like tiny. Sometimes your faith is very big. The Lord exercises our faith all the time, I, in my opinion. Give us this day our daily bread. Exactly. So, yeah, go back to chapter 6, verse 2. A large crowd followed him because they saw the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. So, <clears throat> Jesus is now getting more well-known. He started in obscurity, right? Theoretically. How well known is Jesus today? Right. He is extremely well known. They use his name as profanity. Have you ever heard uh, anyone say, uh, you know, yell Allah in uh, frustration? No. Why? Because, well, <laughs> And because Jesus' name has power, always does not. And um, <clears throat> so, so yeah, Jesus is getting well known. He started in obscurity, and notice that in this verse there are multiple unrecorded healings. You know, we'll see at the end of the book. John says there are so many more signs that I could have written. But these signs, these seven signs, were written so that you would believe. And by believing, have life. Have eternal life. So yeah, verses 5 and 6, he's talking to Philip, and he sees all this huge crowd and asks Philip, where should we buy bread so that these may eat? And it then immediately says he did that to test Philip. Um. Does anybody have a story of how the Lord has tested them? Yeah, I remember when we moved from El Paso up here, we had a big dog. And uh, we stopped at a motel to spend the night, and they said no pets. And uh, <clears throat> so I said, and uh, the temptation was to hide the dog. And I thought, nope. I'm going to tell them about the dog and ask if they'll let us, you know, because I didn't want to lie. And I said, we have this dog. I know you have your sign says we can't have a pet. Can we have the dog here? We have no place to put them. And they said, yes. 
that built my faith. You know, it's a small thing, but um, I think things like that, where you say, you know, you're you're fra faced with a choice. You know, you can get what you want by cheating, and the Lord says, no, do not do it, or you can get what you want by praying. <laughs> And sometimes the Lord still says no. But, uh, you know, many times he'll say yes. And he'll make what seems to be impossible possible. So, um, and he builds our faith that way. So then verse 10, Jesus, so, you know, Andrew, Andrew is helpful. He says, hey, there's a kid here. He has a little sack lunch couple of sardines and, and some, you know, potato chips, <laughs> some little, uh, some little barley loaves. And so Jesus says, have the people sit down. Now here it says the men sat down in number about 5,000. <clears> in Matthew, it says they had their families with them. Mm -hmm. The 5,000 had their families. So it's probably 20,000 or so. Yeah. Their children and there were their wives and everybody and everybody was hungry. He said a prayer for the food. You know, like we say the blessing before we eat. He thanked the Lord for the food. And then <clears throat> and passed it out. And as he passed it out, it just kept going. It just kept going, you know. And, uh, you know, this had happened in history because Elijah did, you know, the Lord used Elijah to do something like that with the oil that never went away for the, I forget, she, a woman in uh, Zarephath, I think it was. And uh, Elisha also did, he didn't make as much, but um, he multiplied food also. God used him to multiply food. So this, this has precedent in history, but not as great as this. And then look at verse 13. So they gathered up the fragments and filled 12 baskets. How many disciples are there? There's 12 disciples. So a basket for each disciple. So you got a big lunch. <laughs> As the disciple who was involved in ministry with Jesus. So that was their reward. So what does this sign tell us? God provides. Exactly. God made us. He will sustain us. He knows we need to eat. And that's what uh, Matthew 6, 31 and 33 says, you know. Um, seek the kingdom of God and everything else will be given to you. Okay, so that is the fourth sign. So just to review quickly, the first sign was 180 gallons of water turned to fine wine. The second sign was the immediate healing of a young man who was about to die from an infectious disease. The third sign was a 38-year paralytic, so it was healing a neurologic disease of long standing. And this is the fourth sign now, which is multiplying food from a little boy's lunch to feed 20,000. Now, the quarterly skips the fifth sign, which I think is silly. So... And the, the fifth sign is Jesus walking on water. So verse 15, Jesus was perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. Okay, so they said, we want this guy as king. And Jesus was presenting himself as king. So why did he do this? Jesus' kingdom comes first with dealing with the problem of humanity, right? Which is the sin nature. And they wanted to bypass that. They wanted to put him in place with their sin nature intact. And that he was not interested in that at all. The Antichrist will do that. The Antichrist, he doesn't care about the sin nature. And he will give people peace, so-called, without dealing with the sin nature. <clears throat> and it will lead to 
seal judgment number two, which is worldwide war. <laughs> so, so yeah, Jesus was not interested in what they were proposing here. So he left. And then, um, and the other thing is, Jesus is the only life that was scripted in advance before it started. I mean, much of his life was predicted before it started, and he, he, and he mentioned that. You know, he said frequently, this is done to fulfill prophecy. And if they had made him king, then the prophecy of Psalm 22 would be falsified. The prophecy of Isaiah 52 and 53 of the suffering servant would be falsified. So uh, that's the other thing. He came to fulfill a script. Okay, so the walking on water, verse 19. So the disciples started across the Sea of Galilee in a boat. Jesus was alone. And uh, it began to become stormy. We've seen that before. Well, in other Gospels. They'd gone three or four miles, and then they saw Jesus walking on the water, coming to the boat. <laughs> now, can you imagine? No. You, I would freak out seeing something like that, you know. And then look immediately what he says to them, verse 20. It is I, do not be afraid. In Revelation chapter 1, when John, who was like his closest buddy when he was on the earth, saw him, he fell down like he was dead. And the next thing that happened was Jesus said, don't be afraid. He's always telling us that. Don't be afraid. You know? So what does the sign of the walking on the water tell us about Jesus? He can suspend natural law at will, like gravity. He suspends gravity, so he hovers on the water. I don't know if he's hovering on the water. Maybe he's touching the water, maybe. I don't know. But natural laws do not necessarily need to apply to him. Or for Peter. Well, yeah, he gave Peter the chance to do it because Peter wanted to do it. And Peter did it for a little while until he noticed what was around him. Yeah, that is why we need our faith exercised. So it's strong when the time comes. You know, that goes along with testing the spirits, right? We might hear something that sounds good, but it's not biblical. So it's from a false source. So <clears throat> Jesus, you know, through the scriptures, has given us a way to test if a supernatural event is legitimate or if it's satanic, which is very important in our day. I would say. Okay, so let's go on to B now, giving the true bread from heaven, which is chapter 6, verse 25 through 40. So look at verses 26 and 27. Jesus is chiding them, kind of. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. And he tells them, don't work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life. So when you were saved, do you remember why you believed? What was your motive for believing? That's what he's dealing with here, their motive. He's dealing with their motive. Some of us believe so early we don't know why. <laughs> Right? Yeah, I, I remember, I was young, I was seven, but um, it was a good news club, and they said, if you believe in Jesus, he will give you eternal life. And it was, and it was a picture of a box wrapped as a present, and I wanted it. <laughs> I wanted that, you know, because you're afraid of not life, you know, you, you want to live, I want to live, you know, you want eternal life, that's why, that was my motive, I wanted eternal life, so I said, sure, I'm in, <laughs> you know, and uh, 
I didn't really know that much about hell at the time because I was seven and no one had taught me about that because they probably didn't want to scare me. That's yeah. Yeah, if you read the book of Ecclesiastes, that comes through real strong. You know, Solomon, who was saved, but had fallen away, writes from a viewpoint of the unbelieving and how it, you know, not totally, but you see the viewpoint of the unbelieving. And at the end, he says, obey God. And, that, you know, and it's hopeless. It is... Ecclesiastes, I, I find very fascinating because, um, you know, you see just the hopelessness without the Lord and the, and the just the repetitiveness and the just, you know, unending, <laughs> you know. I see why people get despairing if they don't have the Lord. Verses 28 and 29, I think, are extremely important. Extremely important. Therefore they said to him, So what shall we do so that we may work the works of God? That was their response to what he said before. Don't work for food which perishes, but for food which endures to eternal life. So they so they asked, Okay, what 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 should we do? If they're reading their Bible, they should have known already. But he says this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So how many conditions are there? One condition. And it is not a work. It is directing your faith to the correct object. And he is the correct object. We all have faith. Everybody born has faith and they put it in something or other. But if you want to have eternal life, you put your faith in him as the object. And that is how we are to live then, after that, by faith in him and understanding that this word comes from him. And so when this word speaks to us, it's from him. And so we say, okay, because you say so, I will do that. <clears throat> so when people say to evangelize the lost, turn from your sins and accept Jesus Christ, they have it backwards. The unbeliever cannot turn from their sins. They only have a single nature, which is at war with God. They're unable to turn. They cannot turn until they accept Jesus Christ and he gives them the Holy Spirit. He gives them the new nature. And then the Holy Spirit will come in and he will say, there are things in your life which are not right. They're not glorifying God. And then your new nature will submit to that because you have the power to do so. And that is how you grow. So when we evangelize the lost, we don't need to talk about their sin. The only sin that sends them to hell is unbelief in this object of faith, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> that is what we need to tell them because that's what the Spirit convicts them of. The Spirit convicts the world of sin, righteousness, of judgment, of sin. Why? Because they don't believe in me. He, he took every sin in the world, put it in a bag, and absorbed it. So the only sin now that sends you to hell is unbelief in Jesus Christ. That is it. <clears throat> and the church for centuries has been <laughs> preaching the wrong thing. For centuries. You know, I read something about, uh, it was written by Schofield, that uh, much of the church t teaches Galatianism. This is the first letter that Paul wrote. AD 48 to the Galatians, and it was had really no commendations. He says, verse 6 of Galatians, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel. Because, you know, Judaizers had come in and wanted them to be under the law. 
and uh, the Lord delivered us from the law. So in verse chapter 3, verse 1 of Galatians, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ is publicly portrayed as crucified? This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? So doing works doesn't give you the Spirit. Believing in Jesus gives you the Spirit. So he says, are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Yeah, I think it's very important for us to learn this. If we attempt to live the Christian life by our flesh, we will be crushed. Because the Christian life is an impossibility to the flesh. You know, I mean, Paul elsewhere says that the Spirit is antagonistic to the flesh. The flesh is antagonistic to the spirit. They're directly opposing forces. And uh, so if you're trying to do the live by the flesh, by your own good deeds, you will burn out or you will fail or, you know, you can't do that. You have to just submit to the Spirit. Say, okay, you're urging me to do this. Okay, I'll do it. And if the Spirit urges you to do it, you'll achieve the power to do it. And living that way is a rest. That's what the, the rest we're called to, is living that way, living by faith. We don't have to do anything, okay? We just live in relationship with God, and when he urges it something, we say, hmm, Okay, yeah, I'll do that. Or he says, something in your life you got to fix, friend, buddy. <laughs> you say, okay, I'll do that. You know, <clears throat> he'll give you the power. So, so, yeah, once born again, you have the ability to repent of your sins. And that's a variable thing, right? Not everybody does it as much as others. Some people will remain in the flesh. They're saved, but they choose to go back to the flesh. It's comfortable. We like our sins. Sins are pleasant. <laughs> exactly. Sins are very pleasant for a short time. And then you pay. Dearly and for a long time. <laughs> but for a short time, sins are very pleasant. Yeah. So verse 30, yeah. verse 630 is hilarious because after there's these signs, there's these all these signs he's performing on the sick. He's walking around. He's literally a supernatural juggernaut, you know. And they say, uh, what then do you do for a sign? <laughs> so that we will believe you, you know. You know, you can see Jesus slapping his forehead. You know? <laughs> they do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they're, it's just shaking his head. So then verse 35 of chapter 6 is the first of his I am statements. <clears throat> Remember, Moses asked the burning bush, who should he tell the children of Israel was sending him? And he said, I am. I am that I am. So the eternal one, and here he uses the phrase, I am, and then he adds a qualifier, the bread of life. I believe there are seven I am statements in the book of John. So, I am the bread of life. In other words, I am your sustenance. I feed you. <clears throat> if you're eating dinner, Jesus has fed you. And then verse 37, are there any that Jesus will turn away? that come to him. Will we turn anybody away? No. Nobody. Yeah, he says, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes, I will certainly not cast out. He will accept any who come. The whole world is savable. The whole world is savable. But we are made in God's image, and some will choose not to accept it. Then verse 40 is the promise of our resurrection. 
Everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life. And I myself will raise him up on the last day. Now, <clears throat> does he qualify that with any certain works of the believer? He, no, he does not. So that indicates that there there is a doctrine called partial rapturism. Whereas only those people who are walking in faith at the time of the rapture will go, and then some will have to go into the tribulation, and they will go individually as they start walking in faith. You know, it's never defined how well you're doing before you go. Um, this refutes that. It doesn't matter what your walk of faith is. It matters whether you're in Christ or not. As far as the rapture is concerned, the unfaithful believer, the lot in the church, will go in the rapture. And then he'll have the Bema Seat judgment. And he'll probably not do that well <laughs> at the Bema Seat judgment. But he will be part of the church. He will be in heaven. He will come back with Christ to rule. And, who, you know, I don't know what kind of job someone who has uh, no reward at all will be given. I've, I've heard it described as graduation, you know. Some get a lot of rewards, some get no rewards. Everybody's happy. <laughs> Everybody's happy to be graduating, you know. That's how, it, that's how it is. So we're on letter C, eating the bread of life. This is where Jesus really challenges them. So can I get somebody to read 41 through 59 of chapter 6? So yeah, that verse 59 tells you where he was. So he was in Capernaum <clears throat> on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee in a synagogue where they taught dietary laws. Right? Gruesome. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds very gruesome. It does. It sounds like uh, Hannibal, you know. At, uh, isn't there a movie about a guy who ate people? Hannibal? Yeah, Hannibal Lecter, yeah. Can you imagine? I mean, the Jews have been taught these strict dietary laws for 1,500 years. And they're hearing this guy teaching in their synagogue and saying this. They were freaking out, probably. Mm -hmm. They were freaking out. Yeah, I find it interesting. Jesus did not always make it perfectly, you know, yeah, and they've been trained. They should, yeah, they should think through this. They should. So going back to verses 41 and 42, they were saying, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? So what does that mean? They don't know who his true father is, yeah. <clears throat> is that he was familiar to them. So he can't be anybody great, right? If it's the kid down the street, you know. So, yeah, so familiarity does very frequently breed contempt. And he said that in another place, you know, a prophet is without honor in his hometown. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> so, again, that's where the Bible comes in. You know, you listen to what they're saying and you read the Bible. And you say, does it match? If it matches, check. Okay. We'll listen to you. It is a difficult statement. So, um, in verse 43 through 44, this brings up a topic that I always find interesting. Jesus says, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. So this brings up the topic of election versus free will. So um, I'd like some people to look up some things, if you would. Can I get somebody to look up Romans 8, 28 through 30? And 2 Peter 3, verse 9. 1 John 2, verse 2. This, in my opinion, is the most difficult theological concept in the Bible. I think it's more difficult even than the Trinity is. Um, and I have struggled with it for years, but I feel like I've come to a conclusion 
and I pray that it's the right one. <laughs> okay, so when God made m man and woman, he said this. This is Genesis 1, 26 and 27. God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So we were created in God's image. God is a decider, right? He decides what he wants. He decides. He made us in that image to choose. Okay, Paul, can you read Second Peter 3, 9? The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Okay, so God wants every single person to come to repentance. Every single one. Now, we know that not every single one will. Why is that? If God wants them to, that's the issue, right? It says right there in plain Greek, translated to English, <laughs> that God desires for every single person to come to repentance. Okay? So what does your passage say? Now, 1 John 2, verse 2. Yeah. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Right. So God wants everyone to come to repentance. Mm -hmm. Jesus has provided a way for everyone to come to repentance, the whole world. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Mm -hmm. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So this is how I understand it currently. I used to feel like... Uh, Calvin has taught that we are so depraved that we have no faith at all. None. So we must first be given faith, and then God causes us to believe. Okay? If that's the way it works, then perseverance of the saints would make sense because we had no choice. We're given the faith. We're caused to believe. So it's all God, it is none of us, and so we're robots. That's what that would imply, that God made us in his image, and he tells us to choose, and he gives us the freedom to do so. So we are depraved, mm -hmm. but there is still the ability to choose. Otherwise, all the commands to choose make absolutely no sense. And so <clears throat> that one word in Vicki's passage Foreknowledge, I think, is the key. God sees the end from the beginning. We know that from prophecy. He gave people the ability. He gave them the, all the information they needed to choose. He gave everyone Jesus to save them from their sins. He wants them to be saved, but he will not force them. And he foresees their choice. But if he, if he makes you have faith and makes you believe, you're not a free agent at all. Because that would imply then that he has chosen some to be damned. I don't see that. I can't see that. Well, the foreknowledge has to fit in because it's there. I think that's better than just saying that we are so depraved that we have no choice whatsoever. The, one of Alec's favorite verses is Ephesians 2, verse 10, right? That we, the works, God has prepared works for us. He prepared them. 
works for each of us to do, that we should walk in those works. So anyway, that is fascinating, and it's fascinating to hear the little variances of understanding we have here, just in this small group. But, um, you know, God wants everyone to be saved. He calls everyone to be saved, and on this side of eternity, everyone is invited. He will not screw it up. Yeah, when we're in heaven, we'll look back and say, you've been chosen from the foundation of the world. Those two things are true.